at this particular podcast, um, I stand to reason for classical Christianity and for classical Christian values. And, uh, and that's what we're all about here, kind of a mere Christianity approach. And uh, also take your calls, uh, answer questions that you have, make commentary on the culture and the things that you face as a follower of Christ um, to help encourage you as a follower of Christ and also equip you to stand to reason for classical Christianity and classical Christian values. Uh, normally, uh, you could call in 855-243-9975. Uh, don't do that now. I'm just, for the record, 855-243-9975 and uh, get in the queue and chat with me. Uh, today, though, uh, as whenever I have a, an interview, a discussion with a colleague uh, or an author, that has something to add for you. I don't take callers because I, I want I want my guest all to myself, as it were. But you know, sometimes people ask me uh, what I listen to in the way of podcasts or in the way of uh, um, uh, blogs. Uh, what I go to and, and I read. And uh, when it comes to podcasts, my my answers always the same, not much. <laughs> yeah. uh, just because I'm not one of those internet guys that's surfing all over and listening to all this stuff. I got other things to do, which is to make things f for you, uh, produce some stuff that will help you um, through Stand to Reason. But uh, I do have a very short list and there's only two podcasts. Many of you know I listen to Dennis Prager, there's one. But uh, the other one is William Link Craig's Reasonable Faith podcast, and uh, I also e read as a weekly update piece, which you could subscribe to and, and get in your internet uh, or, or your email as well. And I love listening to the podcasts and also reading the weekly update for a good reason, and that is that both give me insight and often help me solve theological questions or answer challenges that you know, I've been stumped on or, or I'm not entirely clear on. And they do so in a way that kind of gives me a good tutorial and clear thinking. And you know it stand to reason this is what we're about. Uh, a, kind of a subtitle handle for STR is clear thinking Christianity. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and as, if I drink from the reasonable faith well, uh, on a regular basis, it keeps my mind sharp. And I, I think there's an elegance that I experience in uh, Bill Craig's thinking that uh, just has served me well over the years. Uh, and uh, even, even when I disagree with him, which is on occasion, but not today, because we're gonna be talking about uh, his new book, Atonement and the Death of Christ. Here it is right here for those viewing on, on video. And um, the author, of course, William Lane Craig, my guest, and Bill, it's been quite a while since I've had you on the show, and I'm thrilled to have you back. Welcome. Thank you, Greg. It's great to be with you. We are definitely friends of Stand to Reason and so appreciative of the ministry you've had now for so many years. It's been great, too, to learn from you, even from the earliest times when you were teaching, and I was an MA student at, uh, I won't mention yeah. the C that I got in your class, but other than that, you know, we've had a great thing going on, I know, and it's been, thank you so much for your contribution, the many times you've been on the program here, and I just as a little aside, you know, when I went online and looked up your book on Amazon, <clears throat> this particular book, there's a little biographical thing there that, um, and it says here that, let's see, at the age of 16, as a junior in high school, you first heard the message of the Christian gospel and yielded your life to Christ. I'm, I was just curious, am I to understand that very quickly after you heard the gospel for the first time that you embraced it and became a follower of Christ? Or was there a season of kind of back and forth and questioning and that kind of thing? There was a season of about six months mm -hmm. of the most intense soul searching I have ever been through in my life, real agony. And during those six months, I read the New Testament from cover to cover. Mm. Uh, I was introduced to other Christians in the high school, uh, people like this I'd never met before. I, I went to Christian meetings. I read Christian books. It mm -hmm. was a very, very deep search for God that finally ended in my conversion experience. Hmm. Was, would you say that there is one particular thing that, um, well, I mean, made the difference that was the game changer for you? Was it just a collection of things all amassed together? Well, I think it was the overpowering realization 
that God loved me as an individual. Mm. I've always been uh, an aficionado of science, and I understood the modern scientific view of the world, of the size of the universe, mm -hmm. uh, the destiny of mankind, and the idea that the creator God of the universe could love me mm -hmm. just overwhelmed and staggered me. Mm -hmm. uh, because I realized that if this were really the truth, that this is the greatest news ever announced. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I could do nothing less than devote my entire life to sharing this good news mm -hmm. with mankind. So for mm -hmm. me, my conversion was simultaneous with a full-time call to vocational Christian ministry. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's a call you pursued pretty aggressively over the years. And, and mm. that passion that you just described, you had then, it's obviously you still have now, and it comes out in your presentation, your many debates um, that I'm sure many of our, our listeners and your viewers uh, have, have part, participated in, watched, uh, gone to, uh, benefited from. So, and plus your, your website, um, just to mention this for everybody else, reasonablefaith.org, reasonablefaith.org has a massive amount of information on it. And um, we like to encourage people to go to sdr.org to check out if they have questions about things. But uh, th Reasonable Faith is another place you can just type into the search box and there are all kinds of stuff there that will help you, as I said, delivered in a very elegant way. Frankly, Bill, I don't know how you can keep up with all of this stuff. How much volume you produce is just absolutely beyond me. Well, you know, Jan and I uh, have a method we call the turtle method after <laughs> the tortoise and the hare, right. the famous fable. And we really believe that if you just take little steps day by day, relentlessly, ploddingly, steadily, it's amazing. You look back and you say, how did we accomplish so much? Right. But it's just that slow, steady progress that is so productive. Well, that's good counsel. So uh, mm. I don't know if that was how your latest book, Atonement and the Death of Christ, subtitled an exegetical, historical, and philosophical exploration came to be, the tortoise method, little by little here. But let's talk about this because you open the book uh, with these words. Uh, this is a book about the relationship between the death of Christ and atonement for sin. Its controlling question is, how is it that Christ's death atones for our sins? And so maybe um, it would be good to start out with uh, just the meaning of the word atonement. And I, I think most of the people that are listening to the, uh, either of our shows, um, uh, broadly an evangelical audience, have a sense that, well, this is easy. Jesus died for our sins. He paid for me, and that's the basis of God's forgiveness of me, the work of Christ. But that isn't the only way people have understood atonement down through the ages. So let's just start with a definition in general of the word atonement, and then we'll look at some other options. One of the insights that came to me during the course of this research that I never realized before was that the word atonement has two very different meanings. One would be the etymological meaning that is deriving from its original root. It comes from the old English expression at one hmm. meaning a state of harmony or unification. And atonement in this sense would be closest to the New Testament word reconciliation. We're reconciled to God through the death of Christ. Mm -hmm. But interestingly enough, Greg, that is not the meaning of the Hebrew and Greek words in the Bible mm -hmm. that are usually translated to atone or atonement. The Hebrew word is kippur, which most of us know from the Hebrew festival Yom Kippur, mm -hmm. the day of atonement. Of atonement right? And what kippur means is to purify or cleanse, uh, and it takes as its object impurity or sin. Mm -hmm. And so the fundamental meaning of atonement 
is that Christ's death in some way purifies or cleanses us of our sins, and the result of that then will be reconciliation to mm -hmm. God. And this is important because most contemporary theories of the atonement are about reconciliation, but they leave out atonement in the biblical sense of the word. So they are theories of atonement without atonement, paradoxically. In other words, not no purification, no cleansing, at right. least with regards to the way the Hebrew words are used. You mentioned uh, uh, the Greek as well. Uh, yes. So how does the Greek characterize this notion? Hilaskasthai is the Greek word, uh, and this is used several places in the New Testament, and it's the same basic meaning. It means mm -hmm. to cleanse or to purify of sin or impurity. Mm -hmm. So that we have, word is also used in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the mm -hmm. Old Testament. Mm -hmm. So we got similar kind of meanings from both the Old and the New Testament. And I have heard the at one mint uh, way of describing atonement. It's actually easy to remember, you know, for your yes. folks in your audience or your church. But you're suggesting that at one mint is really a consequence, yes. if I understand you, of atonement, reconciliation, and not the nature of atonement itself. That's exactly right, Greg. And that, for me, was a major insight. Mm -hmm. so, so I know that uh, there are like four or five different ways that uh, people theologically have characterized atonement. Uh, one of them entails the notion, uh, well, maybe more than one, uh, we're going to, you defend a particular view um, in this book, and we're going to get in detail to that. But why don't you talk about some of the ways historically the, that Christians uh, committed to scripture mm -hmm. have characterized the atoning work of Christ on the, sure. on the cross. I think it's good to distinguish between what I call the doctrine of the atonement and theories of the atonement. The doctrine of the atonement is very simply that Christ died for our sins mm -hmm. uh, and thereby reconciled us to God. But theories of the atonement down through history have been very different. For example, there's the so-called Christus Victor, model of the atonement, which thinks of Christ's work in terms of his victory over Satan, uh, who had held us bondage, and over the consequences of sin, mortality, death, and hell. And Christ rescued the hostages held by Satan, thereby breaking his power and setting us free from the consequences of um, death and mortality and, and hell. Mm -hmm. That's one theory. Another one would be the satisfaction theory of the atonement, which says that as a result of our sin, we owe to God a debt of infinite magnitude mm -hmm. that we cannot repay. And so what God does is he becomes incarnate in Christ. And since he had no sin, he had no debt to pay, mm -hmm. and therefore he could give his life on our behalf to pay our debt that we owed to God. That's the satisfaction theory. As I recall, that's, uh, uh, was that an, uh, one of Anselm's contributions to the, di yes. the discussion? Okay, yeah. satisfaction. That's right. Okay. This is St. Anselm's theory. And it mm -hmm. sounds misleadingly like the Reformers' theory, but it's actually very different. Mm -hmm. The Protestant Reformers instead held that as a result of our sin, we stand under a legal verdict of condemnation before the bar of God's justice. We are like uh, criminals who have incurred a capital offense and therefore deserve to die. Mm -hmm. But what God did to save us was become incarnate in the person of Christ, and on the cross, he bore the suffering or the penalty that we deserved as the punishment for our sin, thereby freeing us from liability to punishment so that we could be pardoned and reconciled to God. Mm -hmm. Those are, are just three of many, many different theories of the atonement that have been offered historically. Now, this third one, 
uh, sounds to me like the substitution, the penal substitution yes. view that you're That's defending right. in your book. And uh, yes. it's the one I think that a lot of uh, us Christians, uh, when I say us, I mean evangelicals, people who are listening to our programs, are probably uh, most familiar with uh, in my own work and um, trying to make some of this clear to a popular audience. Uh, the story of reality is the title of the book. Um, mm -hmm. I cite the reformers phrase, the marvelous exchange, yes. because there is this exchange, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, 21. Yes. Um, and you cite that in your book that uh, he receives our guilt and we receive his righteousness. So there's that twofold element in it that it amounts to justification. It's all tied in there. So this would be at the core of the penal substitution view. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you give That's a little, right. Yeah, can you give a little more detail of the, the, the uh, calculus, so to speak, of the penal substitution view? Yes, it's very closely connected to the reformer's doctrine of justification. In contrast to Catholic theology, the reformers did not think of justification as God's infusing into us moral virtue that turns us into morally virtuous people. Rather, they think of justification as a legal declaration of righteousness on God's part. He has credited to our account Christ's righteousness and he has credited to Christ our sin and condemnation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And therefore, God offers a legal um, declaration of righteousness on mm -hmm. the basis of the satisfaction of divine justice by Christ's substitutionary punishment. So in the infusion view, that would be the Roman Catholic view, you, you, one is progressively justified, if I understand right. it correctly. That's which, right which strikes me as a conflation of uh, using uh, more Protestant ideas, a, a conflation of sanctification with justification. Would that be a fair way of putting it? Oh, I think so. Uh, I was talking with the Christian philosopher, Frank Beckwith, mm -hmm. who is a Catholic about these issues. And who has and been he... on this show umpteen gazillion times. <laughs> we wrote guy. a book together, of course, over 20 years ago, and Frank's a good, a dear friend. Yes. Well, Frank remarked to me that the Penal substitutionary theory of the atonement fits much better with a Protestant view of justification mm -hmm. than it does with a Catholic view, precisely for the reasons mm -hmm. you just mentioned. On the Protestant view, when God declares you justified or righteous in Christ, it is complete, it is finished, it is forever. Mm -hmm. And although you grow in sanctification, uh, nevertheless, your justification is complete and entire right. and finished. So this explains something. By the way, Frank uh, endorsed your book. I, I, I yes. saw it there on the flap there. It's a very sweet endorsement. And, uh, but it explains something because I was raised Roman Catholic. And oh. uh, I left uh, I, in the Vatican I tradition. I left mid-60s, right when things were getting kinder and gentler, so to speak. But uh, yes. theologically, it seems more distant from, from, uh, from Scripture in, in a number of ways. But then that's a separate topic. What, what you just described, this difference between declaration and imputed righteousness of the penal substitution view, the Protestant view, and the infusion view, which is the Roman Catholic view, helps explain why evangelicals claim confidence in their salvation because of yeah. Christ, and Roman Catholics refuse to claim that confidence precisely because it sounds arrogant to claim you have had oh. enough infusion of grace to be justified by God. Is that fair? Yes, I, I have performed sufficient meritorious works right. uh, in order to merit eternal life. And yes, right. that sounds arrogant, whereas Protestant Christians just glory in the righteousness of Christ that is credited to them without any merit mm -hmm. on their part. You know, it's funny. I was uh, a number of years ago. I was on a, a radio show where there was a a a, 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 um, a Roman Catholic priest, and a Jewish rabbi, and a Jewish talk show host. This was Dennis Prager back in the eighties, mm -hmm. and uh, religion on the line. I was the Protestant, and I was making the case that Jesus was the only way of salvation, and I was accused of being self righteous at that moment. 
And the irony oh. I told them is that I am the only person on this panel who does not think my righteousness is going to get me into heaven, yet I'm the one yeah. who's being accused of self-righteousness. You know, it's, it's kind How of ironic. ironic. Yes, and it's tied to this broader question. Okay, now there there are um, th there's quite a bit of controversy about this view. Um, yes. The uh, 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 penal substitution understanding: Jesus died in our place; he took our punishment, and because he did that, then we can take his righteousness. We're clean before God, and in fact, more than clean, we are holy, mm. sharing in Christ's holiness. As a quick summary, there, um, but. Part of the part of the concern, though, I mean, even somebody as august as C.S. Lewis has been, it seems to me, dismissive of the distinctions here. And here's what he says. I'd like to hear your response. In Mere Christianity of All Places, which is a fabulous book, and both of us, uh, you know, I'm sure, highly recommend it. But um, he writes, we are told that Christ was killed for us, that his death has washed out our sins, and that by dying, he disabled death itself. That is the formula. That is Christianity. That it is what has to believed, to be believed. Any theories we build up as to how Christ's death did all of this are, in my view, secondary. Now, that flies in the face a little bit of the thrust of your book, which is that Jesus is not just Christus Victor, and there's not mm -hmm. just a, um, a, a, um, a satisfaction that's been done, and but but at the foundation, the table, so to speak, of the doctrine is penal substitution. You see that as much more essential, understanding the work of the cross in that way, than certainly C.S. Lewis did. Yes, I, I certainly do think that it's true for someone to be saved, to be a beneficiary of Christ's atoning death, without having an understanding of the penal substitutionary theory of the atonement. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, I do think that this uh, aspect of atonement theory is firmly grounded in Scripture so that any biblically adequate doctrine of the atonement has to include penal substitution as an essential element. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was... Uh, maybe it's because I was raised the way I was with this doctrine uh, solidly in place for me that I was quite surprised to see Lewis um, argue that this isn't really a detail of mere Christianity. What mere Christianity is what he just described. And certainly, mm -hmm. as you pointed out, that's really what people need to believe to be regenerated and reconciled to the Father. But it also surprises me that so many are... Um, they find this controversial and yes. even offensive, yes. and particularly now in more progressive circles. What is going on there? I mean, wh why is this such a hard thing for people to embrace when, and we'll get to this in a moment, the okay. biblical, especially the New Testament support, seems to be so overwhelming? Historically speaking, what happened was that in the late 1600s, there was a Unitarian theologian named Faustus Socinus mm -hmm. who wrote a blistering attack upon penal substitutionary and satisfaction theories of the atonement. And it was, it was a brilliant piece of work. I think the objections to the atonement have never been stated more powerfully than did Socinus. Mm -hmm. uh, and that even contemporary critics don't hold a candle to Socinus. <laughs> and that work was uh, very, very influential in the history mm -hmm. of theology. And I think that when you look at the objections of contemporary theologians to the penal substitutionary element of the atonement, they tend almost all to be neo Socinian objections. Mm -hmm. They are just warmed over versions of the objections that Socinus launched against the reformers. 
Well, um, here's what I'd like to, to do in terms of moving forward. I'd like to look at the New Testament evidence, and I also want to right. talk about Isaiah 53, which is really, maybe it'd be better to start there because Isaiah comes before the New Testament, <laughs> and so much of the New Testament material um, trades on Isaiah 53. <clears throat> and then we'll look at some of the objections as well uh, that people bring up today, which I suspect are much are basically the same ones as Socinus brought up uh, hundreds of years ago. I read over this Isaiah 53 section, and it's actually mm. a portion of 52, yes. and then much of 53 that kind of cover this material. And and uh, to be honest with you, Bill, when I when I when I read over this, these verses resonate so soundly with my understanding of Jesus as my substitute who was punished by God for my sins so that I could be made righteous and stand righteously before the Father, even yes. though I'm not righteous in myself. I can't imagine how somebody could read Isaiah 53 and not come to the same conclusion. Yes. For any of our listeners that aren't familiar with this chapter of Scripture, what Isaiah describes here is this very enigmatic figure called the servant of the Lord. And this righteous servant of Yahweh is described as being punished, uh, as bearing the sins of the people, and thereby making them righteous before God by bearing uh, their sin in his own suffering and death. Well, the commentators on Isaiah 53 will say the central message of this chapter is the notion of vicarious punishment or penal substitution. And what happens in the New Testament, Greg, is that New Testament authors, and I believe Jesus himself, pick up on this figure of the righteous servant of the Lord in Isaiah 53, and they say, that's Jesus. Mm -hmm. They identify that figure with Jesus. And at his arrest and Last Supper, Jesus quotes from Isaiah 53. Mm -hmm. He says, if I do not die, he said, how will the scripture be fulfilled? Quote, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Mm. Uh, a quotation from this um, servant of the Lord passage in Isaiah mm -hmm. 53. And then at the Last Supper, as he describes the elements of the Passover, he says, this, this cup is my blood, which is poured out for many. Again, alluding to the language of Isaiah 53. Mm -hmm. So Jesus and then authors of the New Testament identify Jesus himself with this suffering servant of Isaiah 53, mm -hmm. who is substitutionarily punished for the sins of the people, thereby making us righteous. Uh, you mentioned, by the way, in your book, and you also make the same point um, with, uh, I think, some things that Peter says in connecting his statements yes. with this passage. So Jesus' statement and also in First Peter, uh, and there are other places, but you make the point that these are statements that could not be applied to any other mm. passage in the Old Testament. This is the only place where the language that we see from Jesus at the Last Supper, and I think it's First Peter, uh, matches as yeah. an Old Testament prophecy related to Messiah. That's right. Or even take the very simple statement that we've all heard in 1 Corinthians 15, that Christ, that is Messiah, that Messiah died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Now, what scriptures? What, what is Paul talking about that? When you comb the Old Testament, there is no other passage in the Old Testament that is even remotely about Messiah dying for our sins, apart mm -hmm. from Isaiah 53. Hmm. What does Peter say? Can you? Uh, he says, point? for he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, mm -hmm. um, using the language of sin bearing that is from Isaiah 53. Mm -hmm. um, and then says uh, that uh, through his uh, stripes, we are healed. Through his, mm -hmm. his wounds, right. we are healed. 
Right. I, uh, you also cite a passage. I've been in First Peter a lot lately, so, partly because of the direction that uh, the culture is going. And uh, First Peter is written uh, as a number of New Testament books explicitly to suffering Christians. So I think there's uh, a lot in there but uh, for us now. But um, hmm. uh, he also says, just as Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves for the same purpose. Now, I guess that's not necessarily... Uh, an explicit uh, reference to Isaiah 53, but it, it does identify what's going on in there. And then, of course, Jesus' experience mm -hmm. and makes application to us as Christians to expect the same kind of treatment. Yes. I think that the key language here is the phrase that I quoted about bearing our sin, because mm -hmm. this notion of sin bearing is a common Hebrew idiom right. uh, that means to be punished or to be held liable to mm -hmm. punishment. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is a, a, a phrase that is pregnant with meaning. So when you say liable to punish, the way it's used in the Hebrew is it's used characteristically of guilty people. Right. Who oh, bear yeah. the guilt and therefore bear the punishment. Is that fair? Yes, that's right. So, uh, a, a sinner he shall bear his guilt, the, the mm -hmm. scripture says over and over again, meaning he be, he'll be held liable for punishment. The only exception is that sometimes the priests who make atonement for the people in the tabernacle and the temple are said to bear the sins of the people mm -hmm. by making atonement for mm -hmm. them. And there, it's not their own sins that are being borne, the priests are making substitutionary atonement right. for the people by offering sacrifice. And of course, this whole rich sacrificial system described in Leviticus and carried out for centuries in the tabernacle and the temple mm -hmm. is a metaphor, a, a type of the sacrificial self-offering of Jesus uh, mm -hmm. on the cross. Yeah, and in that regard, you make an interesting comparison um, between the, uh, let me see where my notes are on this, uh, or a discussion about the relationship of the lamb that was slain and the in sacrifice, and then the laying on of hands on the other goat, the scapegoat, which is released. Right. And uh, and there are you identify two aspects of yes. uh, what's going on there that uh, are kind of captured in the person in the work of Christ. When talk about that, right? What you're referring to there is the sacrifice of Yom Kippur that we were talking about earlier, the Day of Atonement, and this was an annual festival in Israel in which all of the transgressions, sins, and iniquities of Israel were cleansed and taken away. Mm -hmm. And it featured this extraordinary ceremony with two goats that are a sort of unit. They're like two sides of the same coat, coin. Mm -hmm. And one of the goats is killed as a blood sacrifice for the sins of the people. And the other one then, the priest lays hands on the goat and places on the goat the sins of the people symbolically, and then it's driven out into the wilderness, symbolizing that their sins now have been decisively removed and taken away. Mm -hmm. And so these two sides of the atonement are beautifully symbolized in this dual sacrifice. What's interesting about Yom Kippur, as I was reading through material, and, and if you just read through Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy, this really can be a confusing mess. Um, just for uh -huh. the casual reader, I could yeah. never make sense out of it in any particular way. A, a uh, bloody mess. <laughs> yes, a bloody mess. <laughs> but uh, I appreciate that as you're resolving this issue of atonement and trying to apply the Old Testament passages in an appropriate way to the work of Christ, you make these distinctions. This is one of the things I really appreciated about have appreciated about you, Bill, is these kinds of distinctions that are really helpful. And you just mentioned one of them. It's only on Yom Kippur that all of the sins are carried right. away. Uh, right. All the other sacrifices are for particular kinds of sins that yes. individuals sacrifice for themselves, and there are some sins for which there is no sacrifice. 
Yes, that's exactly right, oddly enough. The sins committed with a high hand, uh, as the Old Testament puts it, weren't covered by these sacrificial offerings. They were too serious. Mm -hmm. But on Yom Kippur, all of the transgressions, iniquities, and sins are taken away. Well, the reason I think this is significant is because Jesus' sacrifice is meant to reflect the sacrifice at Yom Kippur, yeah. not the sacrifices, the incidental sacrifices that we said. This is some a piece of information I never uh, that never really occurred to me, and now it's coming more into focus. That's um, the burden of the book of Hebrews. If right. our listeners will le- read the book of Hebrews, they'll find repeated references to this uh, sacrifice of Yom Kippur and the uh, taking away of our sins. And mm-hmm. the author there reflects that really, in fact, it's impossible that the blood right. of sacrificial animals could take away sins, right. but the blood of God's own son is of such worth that it cleanses from sin for eternity. So it alerts us then that the sacrificial system in the Old Testament was not efficacious on its own. Right. It was like it might have been. In, in pagan religions, but it, mm. it prefigured or looked forward. I like to think of it as like you're, you're using a credit card that gets, the bill gets mm. paid later, but the effects yeah. of it are experienced in the moment. Would that be well, a I like that thing? analogy, Greg. That's very good, I think. <laughs> We're translators. You know, we take the smart guys and all the good things you say, we try to uh, kind of uh, throw the wall so people can catch it. Yeah. But um, the, I, I want to read just a couple of, um, of the lines here from Isaiah 53, just to emphasize how clearly it seems to me mm-hmm. that um, this substitution is in view by Isaiah in this passage. And uh, v- verse 5, he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Verse 6, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Verse 8, for he was cut out from, cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. Um, Later, verse 10, um, his, he gave his life as an offering for sin. Verse 11, the righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Verse 12, yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And we see a reference to Jesus' high priestly role that is also repeated there in uh, the book of Hebrews. How, again, I I find myself, um, you know, it's unbelievable to me that people don't, you don't, let me put it this way, you don't need to be a biblical scholar to see Jesus here in this passage. And in fact, I've been told that when people read this passage to others, even Jews, and they ask, who is this describing? They always say Jesus, because it seems to fit so clearly um, Jesus' work on the cross. Yes. I don't understand how people can say that penal substitution is not an essential aspect of atonement in the Hebrew Bible and in the New Testament. Well, you also notice how it mentioned here uh, in that you have one whole chapter devoted to Isaiah 53. And incidentally, folks, just so you know, this is a very thorough uh, treatment. Uh, it's exegetical, it's historical and philosophical mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and forensic too. There's, there's a lot of the, the kind of how the legal things work together in a very balanced way that, that Bill has worked out. And um, that, that's, <laughs> That's beyond my ken. Frankly, I'm more interested, certainly for the sake of our discussion, uh, on the biblical material. But I just want them to know that in your book that we're talking about right now, Atonement and the Death of Christ, there is a lot more material that he deals with. And he's looking historically and forensically, looking at how laws work in, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in how in common government um uh, experience and how there's a, a kind of a fit here with many of the concepts uh, 
that we see here in, in justification um, by Christ through his substitutionary atonement. Um, but back to some of the controversy. Oh, by the way, I, my take, I mean, my understanding is, maybe you have something to say about this, is Isaiah 53, when, when, when Jews read it, say, well, the suffering servant is Israel. Mm-hmm. And, and it's almost with a wave of the hand that they seem to just dismiss this passage. Do, do you know of any other more cogent explanations they might have for this passage? I've heard some say that it might be Isaiah himself, but that strikes me as implausible. I want to, to emphasize, Greg, that the burden of my exegesis is not to try to prove that the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 is Jesus. Right. Rather, what I'm trying to show is that in this Old Testament book, the idea of vicarious substitutionary punishment of the servant of the Lord is clearly taught. Mm-hmm. And then you go to the New Testament, and New Testament authors and Jesus himself identify the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 with Jesus. Right. So any Christian who believes in the teaching of the New Testament is committed to that identification. Right. Uh, I, like, I read, read that particular portion that you mentioned there just now, and just to underscore it, your, examined, your, your initial examination of Isaiah 53 is merely to see that whoever is being described mm-hmm. here is one who is suffering vicariously, as you mentioned, for the sins of others. That penal substitution is in view here. We don't even have to ask who satisfies this, who did this at this point. Actually, in Isaiah, he didn't, there was, nobody knew then the foundation was being laid for the one who would do what Isaiah describes. Fair enough? Yeah, right. And then we see, as you document here, um, and I actually never realized, frankly, Bill, until I read your book here, that there were so many uh, either direct or indirect references to Isaiah 53. You've already mentioned a few of them. Mm -hmm. Yes, it permeates the New Testament. mm Mm-hmm. So it's here. Let's talk about some objections because I I, I think that the some of the objections are understandable. Okay. Sure. Uh, and one wonders. I think some of the objections are coming from critics, who are meant to discredit the Bible. In other words, they say I can see that's what it teaches, but what it mm-hmm. teaches is bizarre. And, yes. uh, and, right. and I think this is the reason some Christians might reject it as well. So they might think the notion, notion of, um, of, for example, satisfying divine justice is just plain crude. Okay, so God wants to forgive. Why doesn't he forgive? Why doesn't he just let people go? Why does he got to beat somebody up in this bloody, uh, abusive way in order to accomplish the forgiveness that it seems that he's fully capable of doing by an act of will. Yes. Now, one thing that surprised me during the course of this research is that historically, Christians have actually differed on this very question. A good number of the church fathers, as well as Thomas Aquinas and Hugo Grotius, Mm -hmm. uh, who was a brilliant penal substitutionary theorist, agree that God could have simply chosen to forgive us without demanding the satisfaction of divine justice. But all of those thinkers will say that God chose to do it through the incarnation and passion of Christ because he had good reasons to do it that way. What Aquinas and Grotius both say is that the passion of Christ illustrates two truths about God in a way that is so graphic and powerful that nothing else could have done it. Uh, And that is, it shows the holiness of God, Mm -hmm. his hatred of sin and evil, in that uh, he uh, places upon Christ the penalty of sin that we deserve. The other thing that it shows is the inexhaustible love of God for sinners in that God himself would take on human form and in the person of Christ, 
give his own life mm -hmm. to satisfy the demands that his own justice had exacted. And so in the passion of Christ, we see the holiness and the love of God powerfully, powerfully demonstrated, mm -hmm. much more so than if he had just said, okay, mm -hmm. I'll forgive you all, which right. might have taken on the appearance of cheap grace. Yeah. And certainly, Greg, I think you would agree with me that historically, the passion of Christ, the image of the cross in literature, in art, in film, has proved so powerful in drawing people to faith in Christ, even right. more than the teachings of Jesus. Yeah. It is his suffering and death that have powerfully drawn people to repentance and faith in him. And so even though they, these thinkers say God could have done it that other way, he chose to do it this way because he had good reasons. Now, well, if I might say quickly, the other response by many of the reformers is to say, no, divine justice had to be satisfied because this is an essential attribute of God. Mm -hmm. Just as much as the love of God is essential to his nature and therefore cannot be compromised, so the justice of God is essential to his nature and therefore cannot be compromised. Mm -hmm. And so God had to find a means of reconciling us to himself that compromised neither his love nor his justice. Mm -hmm. And he did it through the self-sacrificial offering of Christ, who paid the demands of divine justice that were our just desert, uh, and, and thereby shows his tremendous love and forgiveness. So there are those two options mm -hmm. that are available uh, in dealing with this question. So uh, to me, that's part of the elegance of the cross, that you have this apparent kind of contradiction, the love of mm -hmm. God so wonderfully expressed in the most famous verse of the Bible, John 3, 16, yes. for God so loved in this way, loved the world, that yes. he gave his son. Yeah. And uh, so the sacrifice and the sacrifice that God himself made on our behalf, I mean, God the Father made through giving his son. Um, uh, Jesus was the one who suffered and died. It was the second person, but it was a sacrifice for the Father in a sense, to give. Mm -hmm. He expressed his love that way. Um, the, the, um, the question that comes up at this particular point is, um, I'm just thinking of it, I cover what I wanted to co cover here, yeah, is that this then, if God, uh, if God did this, the Father did this to his son, um, this is an example of what some will characterize as divine or cosmic child abuse. Mm -hmm. which is a, is, it's a, in, in my view, a grotesque disparagement on this work of God. But oh, how, yeah. how would you, you know, this phrase has come up, especially with the progressive yeah, I, I think this is so gross a caricature, Greg, that it hardly deserves refutation. What the doctrine of the incarnation and atonement state is that Christ voluntarily took on a human nature and gave his life for us in an act of supreme self-sacrifice. So far from being child abuse, this is a wonderful demonstration of God's love for us that um, he would condescend to take on our fallen human nature and, mm -hmm. and give his life to redeem us to himself. Mm -hmm. It strikes me as a low Christology, too, because yeah. um, what's lost in that claim of divine child abuse is that the child that is allegedly being abused is not only doing it by his own voluntary uh, willingness, but the child is God himself. Right, exactly. And, and so the punishment is God taking he, God is taking on his own punishment on himself in the, the person of the, of the word uh, who became flesh in the yeah. person of Christ. And, and I think what that ought to alert us to is that when we hear theologians caricaturing the atonement that way, we ought to probe more deeply into their doctrine of Christ because it may well be that for them Christ is purely human mm -hmm. uh, rather than 
the yeah. third per or the second person of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, when I sum this up in the story of reality, I made a comment that it turned out to be very, very controversial. <laughs> and mm -hmm. that I've had some people really push back hard and like your response to it. But I said is that Jesus came to save us and to save means to rescue from imminent danger. What is the danger? And the danger is the father. And that's the whole notion of uh, propitiation that Jesus said, don't fear him who can kill the body and not the soul, but fear rather him who can throw both body and soul in hell in Matthew 10. Mm -hmm. So the idea that the father is the one who is being propitiated, that is satisfied, whose anger and wrath is being appeased is deeply offensive to people. Um, I'm just curious your comment on the way I characterize that. And uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that, Greg. I, I think that's very dangerous uh, and apt to mislead people uh, into caricatures. I think it's far better to do what you said earlier about John three sixteen that God mm -hmm. so loved the world that He gave His only Son mm -hmm. that whoever believes in Him should not perish. It, we need to emphasize that this is a self giving act of God himself on our behalf, and that it is true that the justice of God must be satisfied. Mm -hmm. But as you just said a moment ago, it is God himself who right. satisfies the demands of his own justice on our behalf. So, so, so I, I wouldn't put it that way. I think it's too uh, apt to mislead. Harsh. Well, I I, uh, I violated one of my own rules in that kind of taking something out of context. More of what I say in that section is it is the father himself who initiated the plan out of his love yeah. to rescue us. But what he's rescuing us from is the wrath that, that he has towards sinners. So that uh, both of them are packaged in there. I guess what people were offended by is uh, not this, this isolated wrath of God because I didn't isolate it that way, but the fact that God needed appeasement at all. Oh, okay. Ah, yes. Well, now that gets back to the question that we've just been talking about. And as I say, I think there are two different ways that Christians have responded to that. One is mm -hmm. to say that it's not necessary, but that he chooses contingently to do this mm -hmm. uh, in this way. And the other is to say that justice is an essential attribute of God, just as is his love. In the book, in the end, I come down in favor of the second option, that uh, justice is an essential attribute of God, and therefore the demands of justice do need to be satisfied in order for forgiveness of sin to take place. So would you agree that the notion of propitiation, like we see in 1 John, he himself mm -hmm. is the propitiation for our sins, is God word, is Father word. It yes. is a satisfaction of, of God's just wrath towards us. Would that be fair? Yes, I, I think that's right. But I, I would say God word rather than Father word. Okay. All right. Fair enough. So um, there was an objection. Let me just see if I, I'm a little tight on this one. So I'll let you respond quickly to it. I actually read it online when I was reading some of the reviews of your book. And uh, oh. this here, the person says, uh, it was the, I think the only one that gave it a number one. And I always go f to oh, the bottom my. to see what people <laughs> complain about, you know. So, um, and here's what he says. He said, Craig begins his biblical review with the skewed emphasis that sacrifice is primarily about God getting something. That's what we were just talking about. Uh, this is plainly wrong because the motif, uh, motif of Jesus as a sacrifice is primarily about God giving. Oh, well, I think that that person must not have read my exegesis uh, about the Levitical animal sacrifices in the Old Testament that were offered for the purposes of the expiation of sin and the propitiation of God's wrath. There is nothing that could be clearer than that purpose of sacrifice in the Old Testament. And I quote uh, the greatest Jewish commentators on Leviticus, like Jacob Milgram, uh, mm -hmm. in support of this understanding of the mm -hmm. Levitical sacrifices. Now, the truth of what the, com the reviewer is saying is indeed that God himself provides the sacrifice, just as he did for Abraham. Remember when uh, he was about to sacrifice his son Isaac, and, uh -huh. and uh, Abraham, or Isaac says, where's the lamb? 
father, mm-hmm. and, and he says, God will provide uh-huh. my son, and God does then provide a ram for sacrifice. And similarly, yes, God has provided Christ as our sacrifice mm-hmm. for sin, and the purpose of that sacrifice is, again, expiation of sin and propitiation of divine wrath and satisfaction mm-hmm. of justice. Mm-hmm. Um, a, a, a cleansing and a satisfaction uh, in those two things. I, yes. I, when I read this first, I thought it was just kind of a false dichotomy. It's not either or. Both things are happening, and it's sure. uh, I think was captured in the clarification of my own citation, and that is that God's love in it gives, but he gives because something needs to be given back to him to satisfy justice. Is that a fair mm-hmm. way of putting it? Yes. Well, well how would you, uh, let's see, I got, oh, uh, I got one minute left here. I don't know if you can do justice to this question. Huh. Um, and and that is uh, human sacrifice. You know what? I'm not going to do this because right. I'm going to direct people. I don't want to crowd you here at the end because this could take more time than we have. But I do want to say thank you so much, Bill, for your tremendous contribution to the body of Christ over the many, many, many years that you've been doing this, uh, the contribution you've made to my own life and to the many, many, many listeners uh, from Stand to Reason in addition to the Reasonable Faith crowd. And uh, like like I mentioned earlier, you've been a, a great tutor for me, um, theologically, philosophically, and in just the area of clear thinking. Mm-hmm. And I just want to thank you for that. And uh, thank you for coming on board with me today. Well, it's been a joy, Greg. And those are very humble remarks that are much appreciated. Yeah, well, you do a great job, and uh, Dr. Craig is known most, I think, for by many people for his debates with atheists, and if you ever want a tutorial on how to do that, uh, just go to YouTube, and you'll find the information there. The book, once again, is Atonement and the Death of Christ, uh, an exegetical, historical, and philosophical uh, exploration, the author, Dr. William Lane Craig. I'm Greg Kokel for Stand a, we- Stand a Reason. I sound like Porky Pig there. Uh, stand a weasen <laughs> or STR, let's put it that way. Go out and give them heaven this week, friends. Bye bye now.